I'm reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, a section of Scripture that is generally referred to as the Christmas story. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the angels returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The real beauty of Christmas. My wife and I have had the opportunity to travel through many parts of our country at Christmas time. All kinds of decorations, uh, lights, uh, all kinds of ornaments, uh, yard decorations, uh, twinkling lights, lights that burn solid, just every kind of a decoration that could be imagined, all contributing in its own way to the to the beauty of the season. But in spite of all the beauty that the decorations bring to the, to the celebration of Christmas, those do not actually signify the significance of the Christmas season. They do not show us what is the true beauty of this season that we're celebrating at this time. So this morning, we think in terms of what gives real beauty and where we find real beauty as we celebrate the Christmas season. The first thing Luke records here as he describes the events leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ tells us first of all about the mystery that surrounds Christmas. There is, there is beauty in Christmas because of the mystery that surrounds it. I've heard people say before, I love a good mystery. If you're a person who loves a mystery, then you should really be ecstatic about the Christmas story because it's through some of the greatest mysteries that the world has ever known that we're introduced to the Christmas event itself, to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke, in sharing the events that lead up to the uh, to the actual birth of Jesus describes for us some of the 
the mysteries that go with it. The first one is the mystery of God's plan for the birth of Jesus. And that, that begins for all of us with an understanding of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. There are many people who say, I can't understand that. I can't, I can't grasp how there could be a virgin birth. But the fact that we don't understand it does not change the fact that it's real. The fact that we don't understand doesn't change the fact that God has a message for us in this. In fact, if we could understand everything there is to know about the virgin birth, then somehow it would demean and degrade the significance of it. When Gabriel the angel came down and, and spoke to Mary, he told her, that she had been chosen of God and that it was through her that the long-awaited Messiah would come into the world and that he would be the redeemer of all people. And in the first chapter, in the 34th verse, Mary said to the angel, to Gabriel, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? In other words, she knew she was not married yet to Joseph, even though they... Uh, were engaged. She knew that she had never had a, a sexual intimacy with anyone and she was just simply asking how can I become pregnant when I have not had any kind of an encounter of a sexual nature with any man. And Gabriel goes on and explains to her that that event which is going to take place in you is going to be caused by the power of of the Holy Spirit as He overshadows you and moves upon you and moves in your life. God's plan for the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, God in the flesh coming into the human race was through the virgin birth. Some people say, well, I will never be able to accept that there could be such a thing as a virgin birth. If you have a problem accepting the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, you're going to have a great difficulty finding yourself, finding a way into the kingdom of God. Because this lies at the very, at the very heart of the gospel. It is the distinctiveness, it is the uniqueness of Jesus that we find through the virgin birth that He is qualified to be the Savior of the world. And so, it's through the mystery of God's plan of the virgin birth that we begin to see uh, something of the significance of what the gospel message is going to be about. But then there's also a mystery about the place of Jesus' birth. There was a decree that was sent out that all the people had to be taxed. It was a, a census more than anything else, but taxing generally followed the census. They wanted to know who the people were, where they were, where they were living, how many of them there were. Each person had to go to the hometown of their birth, and so Joseph takes Mary with him from Galilee, and they go up into Judea to what the Bible calls the city of David, which is Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem simply means house of bread. And so it was about a 70 or 80 mile journey for them to go. I, I cannot conceive of what the journey must have been like for Mary being in pro probably the, the third trimester of her pregnancy, the last three months at least, if not within the last 30 days. They had to make this journey of many, many miles and she would have spent most of that journey riding on the back of a donkey as Joseph tried to get her to the place where they could uh, do the census work and where they could be registered knowing that a taxation was coming. And so it was in this place that God saw fit for Jesus Christ to be born. If you go back to the book of Micah in the Old Testament, Micah was a contemporary of the prophet uh, Isaiah in the middle of the 7th or the 8th century B.C. And through Micah the prophet, God said this in chapter 5, verse 2, 
But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, even from everlasting. God had promised that there would come a Redeemer. There was a Messiah coming who would deliver the nation of Israel, who would ultimately deliver all people from their sins if they were willing to trust in Him and His redeeming work. So in this place called Bethlehem, it is a fulfillment of God's prophecy that, that Jesus was to be born there. It was no accident. It was not some... Uh, circumstance that took place that brought it about. It was the very hand of God that brought them to this place where Jesus was going to be born. Chapter 2 verse 7 says simply that she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. She laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. During the time of census <coughs> People were traveling all over the world. They were all trying to get back to their, to their homeland, to where they were born, so they could register for this census. And as they, they made their way back, the time came that Mary would bring forth uh, the baby Jesus. And as they were traveling, they realized that there was no vacancy at the local inn, what we would call a, a hotel, a super eight, or some such place. There was no room for them. And of all things, for the very Son of God to be born at a time when there was no room for Him in a regular dwelling place, they were allowed to bed down, as it were, in the local stable. It's one of the great mysteries of God. That Jesus, the Savior of the world, God in the flesh, would be brought into this world through His birth in a stable. But Mary took care of Him. She embraced Him. She, she wrapped Him in strips of clothes, the swaddling clothes. She wrapped Him, no doubt knowing that when she left home, she needed to be prepared in case this happened while they were gone. And sure enough, it did. And so she took those clothes that she had prepared and she wrapped him to, to keep him warm, to keep him good and, and snug and comfortable and secure. And she laid him in a common feeding trough where the animals would eat their feed, eat their hay and, and other items of feed that were given to the animals. And there in a a common stable. It may have even been a cave that was used to house these animals. There we find God making His entry into the human race in the person of Jesus Christ. Surrounded by the sights, the sounds, even the smell of a stable of all things. Surrounded by the animals, there would have been other animals in there besides their own donkey. There may have been uh, sheep or goats. There may have been uh, cattle. Just any number of animals that could have been there. And it's into that surrounding that Jesus is born. He was not born in the finest palace in Rome, uh, attended by the uh, best doctors of the Roman Empire. He was not born into luxury, as we might say. And it's all a part of the mystery that gives such beauty to Christmas. We don't have to understand everything that happened. We certainly don't have to understand the why behind it. But we do have to accept the fact that it is the truth of God. And there is a certain element of mystery about Christmas that gives it such a unique beauty. And then there's the mystery of the proclamation of His birth. In verse 8, we're told that there were shepherds who were watching over their flocks by night. And 
Verse 9 says, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. God did not choose to announce the birth of His Son in the city of Rome where uh, all of the, the leading officials of the Roman Empire were. He didn't choose to announce His birth in the city of Jerusalem where the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees were all located and were going about their, their daily activities of ministering in the temple. He chose to proclaim the birth of His Son to a group of shepherds who were watching over their flocks in the nighttime hours. All of this a part of the mystery that gives us an idea about the real beauty of Christmas. As we drive up and down the roads, as we go about our business in the the shopping centers and in the malls and all the things that we do. We understand how beautiful Christmas decorations can be, but they are not what shows us the true beauty of the Christmas season. The true beauty of Christmas we find, first of all, in the mystery of Christmas. But then we find the message of of Christmas points us to the true beauty of the season. The angel of the Lord came upon these shepherds. The glory of the Lord shone round about them and the angel spoke to them in verse 10 and says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. We need to to try to picture in our minds what it was like for these men. They're, they're out on a dark hillside, perhaps on a, a brightly starlit night. Nothing but perhaps a small campfire to, to try to stay warm. And they're gathered there and uh, maybe just talking among themselves. They're uh, perhaps telling stories or as guys sometimes do when they get together like that, they may have just been lying to one another about their great escapades in life. But here they are. They're out on this hillside in the darkness. Nothing at, at the most but a, a small campfire for light. And suddenly, the scripture says, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Out of nowhere, so to speak, the angel of the Lord came stood in their midst, and there had to be this, this brilliant glow, this, this brilliant lighting that took place in their midst. And you have to understand, and in your own mind, just imagine you're here sitting in the dark, there's nothing going on, just the sound of a few sheep maybe that are, that are moving around. And you go from this pitch black darkness to suddenly... There is an angel standing in your very midst. And the angel says, fear not. Are you kidding me? Don't be afraid. Or literally it says, stop being afraid. Now we're already told that, that they were sore afraid. It literally means they feared a great fear. All of us, any of us, would have feared that same kind of experience if, if suddenly as we're sitting in the darkness and just sitting around the campfire and an angel of God suddenly appears in our midst and there is this brilliant glow and this light that is shining in our presence and the angel begins to speak to us. And the angel says to them, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. There's the message of Christmas. There, there is the, the beautiful message. No matter how many different Christmas carols we hear, no matter how many different kinds of Christmas songs that we might hear, nothing is ever going to compare to the message of this angel to those shepherds that night. 
the very essence of the Christmas story is there is a Savior who is born to you this day in the city of David, he says in verse 11, and this Savior is Christ the Lord. For hundreds, even thousands of years, people had been waiting for the coming of the Messiah the Deliverer, the Redeemer. The people of this day and time were looking for someone to set them free from the Roman Empire. They wanted to be set free from the Roman government. They were looking for that promised Messiah, but their problem was they were looking for a political Redeemer. But God said, I've got something even better than that. I have a, a Redeemer who will set you free spiritually. And so the message of the angel was stop being afraid. By the word, the word fear there is our uh, English word for phobia which refers to an inordinate fear, a, a, an overwhelming kind of fear. And while it's easy to look back and, and think, well, I wouldn't have been afraid. I'd have been glad to hear the angel speaking if we would be honest with ourselves and each other, we would probably all have had it said of us too that we were fearing a great fear. But the very message that this angel was bringing to them was a message of hope. It was a message of comfort. It was a message of peace that the Savior of the world was this very moment in a manger in the city of of Bethlehem. And to you is born this day. The you there is, is plural. In other words, for all of you, for all of mankind, for the whole world, Jesus is coming into the world. He has at this moment been born. And God's message to you is that there is a Savior who is sufficient to save all people from their sinfulness. Jesus didn't just come to save the Jews. He didn't just come to save the Pharisees or the scribes. He came to save all who are willing to turn to Him. Wherever you are hearing this message today, you may be the most vile terrorist that the world has ever known. You may be the most evil thug who has ever walked the streets of some large city here in the United States or somewhere around the world. You may even be the most devout and religious Pharisee that the world has ever seen. But you need to know that there is no redemption, there is no forgiveness, there is no hope apart from Jesus Christ. It is through Him and only through Him that our sins can be forgiven. Unto you is born this very day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The word Christ is really not a personal name. It's a title. It's the, the Greek form of the Hebrew word for Messiah. The Messiah would be the deliverer. He would be the one who would save the people from their sins. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men or literally peace toward those Men in whom God is well pleased. Are you looking for peace this Christmas season? Are you looking for hope? Are you looking for joy? Psychiatrists tell us that the Christmas season is the most depressing season of the year for many people. 
because of their expectations. They want to give everyone the finest gift that can be given. They want to give people the most expensive gift and people go out and they, they spend all the cash they have and then they start on their credit cards trying to buy satisfaction for those that they love. Trying to buy satisfaction even for themselves. But the message of Christmas is not found in a department store. It's not found in the pile of gifts that will be under your Christmas tree on Christmas morning. You see, we don't even know that December the 25th was the day when Jesus was born. We don't know the, the month. We don't know the day, the date. But what we do know is that He was born. And maybe it's best that we don't know the day. We don't, we don't need to get hung up as so many people do in, in worshiping the day. Because you see, God's plan is that every day of your life should be Christmas Day. Because you should celebrate the coming of the King, the coming of the Savior, the coming of the Messiah, the Deliverer, who can set you free from all your sins. You should celebrate that every day. Every waking moment of your life should be a celebration of Christmas. There is real beauty in the message of Christmas. And then the last thing we see as we look at these remaining verses, there is real beauty in the meaning of Christmas. It came to pass in verse 15, Luke says, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, these shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass. Let's go. It doesn't matter what our other schedule may be. It doesn't matter that we might want to go to bed and go to sleep. We've got to go see what is taking place down in the stable. Something was happening in that stable that night. And the thing that was happening is what gives meaning to all of life. And that is that our sins can be forgiven. That this baby that was born into that stable who grew up and lived a sinlessly perfect life, who offered himself as a sacrifice for all of our sins so that we can be forgiven, we can have eternal life, We need to take time to go down to the stable and see what's going on. Matthew tells us in his account of the birth of Jesus Christ that when the wise men arrived there in, in the town that when they saw Jesus that they literally fell flat on their face and they worshipped Him. Here's this Little baby, this newborn baby, maybe even a year, year and a half old by now, but however, however old he was, they knew that they needed to fall and, and worship him. This year Christmas falls on Sunday. And I wonder how many churches will, will call off their services because it's, it's Christmas Day. Of all days, you need to be in God's house. It's the birthday of the King. But every week on the Lord's day, we ought to be in His house. Worshiping the one whom the Scripture says is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so the shepherds said, hey, we got to go see this. And somehow I can just See in my mind's eyes, they make their way and they find the stable where Mary and Joseph and the baby are, and, and they're gathered around him. This group of people who would never be allowed into the temple, they were committed, considered ceremonially unclean because of their occupation. Shepherds had a reputation. 
for being somewhat loose and free with the truth. Some of them, one person said, even had a hard time distinguishing between mine and thine. They had a reputation. But they are the first people that God spoke to on the night that Jesus was born, telling the whole world, salvation is not just for the elite. It is not just for the special. It is not for those who are born into wealth or fame or social standing. Salvation is for all. That's the meaning of Christmas. And these men, after they had visited with this, this little family there in that stable, they returned to their job. The scripture says, glorifying and praising God. For all that they had heard and seen. As it was told unto them. Do you really know what Christmas is about? Do you understand the meaning of it? The real beauty of Christmas is not found in decorations and trappings and nice meals and fellowshipping with family and knowing that you're going to get gifts. The real beauty of Christmas is found in the mystery of it. The real beauty of Christmas is found in the message. And to you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The real beauty of Christmas is in the, the meaning of it. That we can have a right relationship with God. We can know that our sins are forgiven. That we can live every day knowing Every day is Christmas Day and we can glorify and praise God not just in word or in deed but in the very depths of our soul. Wherever you are hearing this message today I simply ask you to pause and consider do you really know what Christmas is about? Has there ever been a time when you have said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died on Calvary's cross so that my sins can be forgiven. And right now I'm asking you to come into my heart and to be my Savior and Lord. Whoever you are, wherever you are, Jesus is sufficient. He is the Savior of the world. Let us pray. Lord, we're thankful to You for this season of the year when we focus especially upon the birth of the Savior. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to see beyond all the trappings and all the decorations and all the hustle and bustle and all the activities of, of getting around and about and trying to do more than we should do. Help us to see beyond all of that and to recognize the true beauty of Christmas because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.